B-B-O-T. Thank you, Tracy. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be back at TBOT and see all the creativity, the innovation, the excitement, the momentum being built around interactive TV and other advanced video services. And we also recognize that in order to support all that creativity and innovation, we have to have viable business models behind ITV to keep it growing and to keep the uh, development moving and to keep us all gainfully employed. So in this session, we're going to talk about the evolution of ITV business models. And in particular, we're going to focus on interactive TV advertising, which is really sort of the, um, the hot area of activity right now. Um, between last year's TVOT and this year's, it's just been a tremendous amount of progress being made. And uh, uh, we also do, along the way, um, we may touch upon some of the other um, business models that are being addressed. Um, at this conference, and there are so many that are helping um, ITV uh, targeted and addressable advertising, VOD advertising, e-commerce, uh, merchandising, um, and I also, you know, always preach uh, too about the business models that are uh, not as easy to quantify the business benefits that ITV provides in terms of increased audience engagement, ratings, tune-in, brand loyalty, subscriber retention, and improved user experience. We could certainly all use an improved user experience with television. So I'm very happy to have a panel of experts here today that sort of represent different parts of the ITV advertising ecosystem. And I'm going to ask them uh, to start by just introducing themselves, um, the company that they're with, and uh, any um, activity that you're involved with from a personal standpoint as it relates to the topic at hand. Bill? Hi, I'm Bill Rosley. I'm EVP of uh, Advertising Sales for Rainbow Networks, which is, for those who don't know, Rainbow One. We are repeat, we branded in a couple of months, AMC Networks, but it's four networks. It's the AMC Network, WeTV, IFC, and Sundance. Uh, as far as relevancy to uh, what am I responsible for, I'm responsible for pretty much, one of the guys I work with said, you should have your title EBL, and I went, what is EBL? And he went, everything but linear. So I'm responsible for digital, VOD, interactive television, and from a what's relevant on this panel for me is I've been in the interactive space now, the interactive television space for close to 11 years. I was with TV Guy Channel when we were talking about an interactive, when we were talking about interactivity happening in the future. Well, now I'm dealing with it today. Um, I'm Bruce Denler. I, I had agency relations for Canoe Ventures, and uh, I guess it has direct relevance on this particular panel because it's about. Uh, speaking with agencies and advertisers and trying to pull the thread across all the various uh, kind of voices that get involved in, in the production of an a interactive campaign, um, specifically as it relates, as it relates to, to new products, which uh, for the moment there is one and, and we'll have more uh, coming down the road. And uh, I think I'll talk about that a little bit later um, as we get into kind of updates. But uh, my background is an agency background, much like Chris's, who I'm going to turn it over to in just a moment. Uh, so I've, I've been involved in the, in the advertising industry for a long time, um, pretty steeply involved in the traditional advertising industry, and where traditional advertising and advanced advertising start to collide is actually a, a fascinating place. So looking forward to the discussion. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Allen. I work at SMGX, which is a division of Starcom Media Best Group. And we're one of the largest agency holding companies um, globally, actually. And uh, I work in a specialty team that is really charged with understanding the advanced television landscape and then helping to lead our clients in the space. So I spend a lot of time working with the folks at Canoe, the different operators, um, working with different set-top box data providers um, to really help develop a marketplace around advanced television and really try to drive incremental spending into that space. 
No, no. Thank you. My name is Chip Bean. I run the West Coast for Comcast Spotlight Integrated Media Sales. Comcast Spotlight is the ad sales arm for Comcast Cable Division. We have systems in 80 markets that touch 29, video, 29 million video consumers. About 18 million of those are digital and they have access to VOD and all the ITV applications we'll be talking about. We have um, two set-top boxes per home in that digital footprint, so we've got some pretty good throw weight out there to play with. And our team has got one foot in biz dev, so we're working with advertisers to figure out best practices, what works, what doesn't, as we roll these products out, and we're still working with the product team as well to come up with new and better products over time. Uh, the products are rolling out well, the economy is supporting us for a change, and life is good. Uh, hi, uh, I'm uh, Peter Lowe, I'm the President and CEO of InSequence. Um, and InSequence uh, provides uh, distributors and programmers and advertisers, in fact everybody on the panel is using InSequence, which is so it's wonderful to be here. Uh, but we, we provide all of them uh, with a platform that allows them to create lots and lots and lots of interactivity um, dependably and affordably, uh, whether it's on a cable system or telco or satellite or smartphone or tablet or connected television. <laughs> okay, we said there's been a lot of activity over the past year. We just want to start by giving you an update of what's actually happening in the marketplace. Um, Clearly, a lot of that activity has been driven by Canoe Ventures, backed by six of the largest MSOs in the country. So we're going to start with Bruce, and Bruce, just a quick update on Canoe and what you're seeing in terms of uh, your relationships with the ad agency. Great. So uh, just a background on Canoe for those who don't know, which I think would probably be odd at this point in the conference, but a uh, joint venture of the six major cable companies. Uh, what's happening is we're developing a, a unified cross-MSO cross EBIF-based platform, uh, interactive platform, uh, which is now teetering on the very edge of 20 million uh, footprint right now, EBIF-based uh, footprint cross-MSO. Uh, we've got three networks on the um, platform now with the RFI product, four more to come in, in within the next couple of months, and then building the footprint as well as the number of networks from there. Um, so it's uh, we're kind of kickstarting the market right now, which is which is wonderful and exciting. And uh, as it relates to kind of our agency relations and relations with advertisers, boy, there's been a heck of a lot of conversation. It's all been kind of evangelical up to this point, and now we're kind of hitting the point of, of like business discussions, which is a little bit different once you start getting into pricing models and, and actual kind of back end metrics, etc. That's that's literally where we are right now, which is kind of steeped in those those more realistic conversations as opposed to, hey, look what's coming. It's, okay, it's here now and it's growing. Where do we go from here? So that's, that's really where we are. Okay, and Comcast, in addition to supporting Canoe, Comcast Spotlight, uh, doing a lot of activity in a lot of different um, advertising areas, <coughs> advanced advertising areas. Chip, why you update us on some of the things there? Yeah, Bruce and I are very much joined at the hip, not just in terms of the investment in Canoe, but also the fact that our products are so tightly interrelated. In addition to the RFI product, which we started rolling out in Chicago, really, this uh, March of last year, and is now fairly fully deployed across our entire digital footprint, we have two additional products. One is Remind Record, um, and the functionality is something that's very TiVo-like, uh, where a prompt will come up and let an let a consumer set either a reminder or a recording for a particular program or series. And I think we're all pretty familiar with that application. That's found some pretty good acceptance amongst our programming partners. And I think really more exciting for us is the VOD-T, the telescoping 30-second spot, where 30 will actually take you and telescope you directly to a long-form asset. And I think that works in a number of different ways. It changes the communication between us and the advertiser and the advertiser and the potential consumer. We're all pretty good as an industry at telling stories in 30s, and the public is pretty good at accepting that messaging in a 30-second format. But we all feel that more is better. And so having an engaging 30, which gives the consumer 
the opportunity to self-select to go into a VOD asset where we can measure what they do and spend more time and potentially even save that asset to share with family members ends up creating a whole new, dy whole new dynamic in terms of advertising. It's no longer sit back, it is now lean forward. And um, that is something we've had a lot of success with and we're pretty excited about. <coughs> Bill Rainbow is one of the first uh, programming companies to sign on with Canoe. Um, how's it going? Well, to augment, I think what Chip said, I mean, everything you said on the, on the spot side and the local side is also true on the national side. But I think the difference on what Canoe brings to, and yeah, we, Bruce and I sit a lot side by side also. Uh, he's got a lot of folks attached to his hip right now. But uh, one of the things that we that we bring to, or that Canoe allows us to bring to advertisers, and I think it was said in one of the panels yesterday I was at, is if you don't bring scale on a national basis, there really is not a dialogue. And we serve two masters. We have to go into a national advertiser and say that we are going to reach the country. 20 million as a footprint to start is great. We're gonna scale up. Eventually this will get full deployment. And this is one of the, uh, the opportunities that will be in front of a national advertising agency. And you know the ultimate goal here is to make it one of the tactics and one of the, the tools at an agency's uh, disposal to be able to reach that national that, that consumer. And really it's two different metrics. You know, we use interactive television as this buzzword. Well, there's two different things that we're dealing with on a national basis. One is RFI, and that's a marketing opportunity. We're talking about sampling, we're talking about couponing. That's one engagement level. The other is kind of what Chip was talking about, and that's where you've got, and you have uh, consumers engaged or viewers engaged in that spot. And there'll be a lot of different opportunities in interactive television that will do that, as well as RFI does that right now. Peter, um, you are you are an enabler. I don't mean that in a bad way, but uh, I'm the, the drug dealer up here. <laughs> okay, but push him in. Uh, no, you're involved. Your, your solutions are involved uh, in a lot of different business models and, and development. What's going on from the sequence attempt? Um, well, everything that you've heard is going on from in sequences end. So I'll, I'll just I'll answer that in two ways. Um, one is this feels really great to be on this panel because for so many years uh, the, the solutions providers were kind of evangelizing this business and we would talk about where we thought the business was going to go and you know what the metrics ought to be etc and now you know I can just sit back on this panel because these guys are actually making the business happen and it, it feels it feels really even different than it, than it did a year ago because these are these are the guys that are going to make the business which is just wonderful. So, um, you know, we, we are in a bunch of businesses, um, as, as you say, so we're in the service provider business, we're in the national uh, platform business with Canoe and with Rainbow and with others. Um, uh, we're also in the e-commerce business, we're in the engagement business, um, there, there, are, there, are, there are a whole bunch of um, ancillary devices now and two-screen solutions that we're, um, we're enabling, <laughs> as, as, as you say. Um, the second thing I want to say is this whole concept of engagement, um, because there really is a tremendously valuable model around engagement, and I, I, I completely agree with what Bill is, is saying on this. And just to throw out some engagement <coughs> statistics. So, uh, you know, we've done a whole bunch of in-programming interactivity over the last many years, and we can boil down the results to a couple of really compelling metrics. One is that typically 20% of the people that are watching anything in programming uh, uh, will go interactive, big number. And the second is that that 20% stays interactive for about 30 minutes. Uh, so if you, if, you just, if you just think about the impact you have in terms of how your, how your viewer is engaged, it's really tremendously different interactive than it is not interactive. And what we're also beginning to see, and, you know, I, I don't want to draw a straight correlation here, but what we're also beginning to see, which, by the way, for guys like uh, like Bill and for Canoe, this is a super easy sell, is we're just seeing ratings growth. Uh, you know, you don't actually have to go sell any interactive premium, you're just selling bigger audience numbers. And, you know, we're seeing ratings growth as a consequence of this engagement, uh, typically from 5 to 20%. So if, if, if those numbers hold, that's just tremendous for the industry. I'm very happy to have Chris here from Starcom because um, 
I feel you know, like a lot of you go to events, you know, with cable industry or whatever, and everybody talks about the glories of ITV advertising, and there are no agency or advertising people in the room. So, uh, Chris, welcome. And uh, what's going on inside uh, Starcom as it relates to ITV advertising? Where, sure. where does it sit these days? Yeah. Um, it sits in a lot of different places. That's one of the challenges that we face is who has ownership of it? Does it live, is it a digital play? Is it a television play? Who's gonna really be leading the charge on that? Um, there's a lot of confusion in the agency and how to use it because there are a number of different flavors of addressability in the marketplace. You know, we've talked about sort of engagement and, and sampling as a couple of uh, benefits of ITV, but we also see just you know pure awareness as another opportunity as well as potentially lead generation. So we really look at those sort of four buckets as, a, as, as the benefits of ITV. Um, the, the challenges often are that um, clients are not really sure what role it's supposed to serve, so we have to really think hard and fast about how is it gonna serve a tactical purpose to achieve an overall strategy, um, and, and how are we gonna implement that. Um, another, another problem is <coughs> costs can start to escalate fairly quickly. So, you know, production charges, non-working media can become an issue for some advertisers who they set aside a media budget and they expect for every dollar in that media budget to actually serve, um, you know, be, be buying media and, and there are production costs associated with, with some ITV applications. And there's also a fairly short shelf life for many ITV approaches. So. We see that when we put up an ITV campaign, oftentimes we're gonna, we're really gonna sort of squeeze all of the response out of that in the first you know, week to maybe two weeks. So if you don't refresh the offer or refresh the content, the consumer is just gonna simply stop responding. So, so that makes it, makes it a little bit more difficult to sometimes push that through. Okay, yes, there are a lot of challenges. There are a lot of questions over the metrics that will be used. Um, we thought that it would be enlightening, uh, hopefully for all of us, to sort of walk through the process of ITV advertising, the sales process, how it's really going to work. Um, I was involved in the advertising community several years ago for a, a couple years, and it is a very unique culture. There are lots of players, everybody has their own role and responsibilities. Um, they don't always get along. We tend to, you know, like, like the cable universe, we tend to talk about advertising like it's just one big monolithic uh, community and we're just gonna go in there with ITV apps and they're just gonna eat it up. Well, not so fast. So let's just sort of walk through the process um, and let's start with you, Chris. You uh, have a number of clients, so, um, and, is there a particular, let, let's say, can you pick one of your, it's all hypothetical here, yeah, but if you want to negotiate this out, we could get the ad launched by noon if you want. <laughs> but let's say, let, let's pick a, a client that you might say, yes, I want to do an RFI or what have you. Sure. So, yeah, so say we have a, a maybe a, a cereal brand. A cereal? A cereal brand, right? And they, they have a new product coming to market and, and they want to deliver samples. Through an RFI application, typically that's going to be running in conjunction with a lot of other different media channels. And you know, I might work with Bruce or, or Bill, and we would we would talk about how you know what is the timing for the release of the sample, um, how is this going to fit into a more traditional linear television package, um, and we're going to begin um, going back and forth on what does that package look like. And and you know, Bill might serve me or deliver me a, a plan and. I'm going to start to take a look at the pricing on that plan, and a lot of that is going to be based on what we've spent historically. So what kind of activity have we had with Bill in the past, and what were the rates that we've paid previously? So it's an interesting time right now because we're, we're starting to enter that upfront marketplace. So much of what happens in the, in the upfront is based on historical pricing bases. So what is the price that we paid a year ago? and what is the marketplace bearing this year in terms of a price increase or decrease versus a year ago. So a lot of it is not necessarily just negotiating the package on its own merits and what is the value of every uh, commercial unit within the package, but what is, what is the, the overall package price um, in relation to what we've paid in the past. So historical bases are an important component. Um, 
in terms of adding elements like ITV to that, that would just that would be another component of the negotiation. You know, Bill would have a certain number in mind, I'm sure, for what he would like to charge, and depending on the the demand from the marketplace, we would sort of ferret out what that real price should be. Um, it could be sort of rolled into the overall package in some instances, um, or it could be a separate line item on a plan. Um, that's there's there's no real standard way for the way it's necessarily going to be negotiated. Mm -hmm. Bill, what do you what do you yeah, want? Yeah, Bill, what are you going to offer? Come on, <laughs> that's proprietary. No, uh, I think one of, one of the sea changes that we've seen over the last year is all of the dialogue that uh, that you just heard would not have been had a year ago because we would have still been in a test mode. We're testing to see what this does. Basically, what Chris just laid out is this is now becoming a tactic of how they're buying media and how they're really looking at their, their full plan. And that is a very big difference. The thing that makes it still unique versus what we do with TV, and I think Chris said it in the beginning, is there's no one that owns interactive television right now, and there is no standardized metric on how to evaluate it. So from the process that we, and actually we have been working, I'd, I'd say, uh, as an industry, uh, Canoe will go out and evangelize to pretty much everyone they can talk to about the value of, will go out from, a, from an AMC perspective, and, I, and I'll never go into Chris or any agency and say, buy AMC. What I'm basically saying is RFI is something that you need to take a look at. There's a re this thing is going to scale nationally, and it's got to become part of your media mix in cable. And all of the other metrics that will follow, the pricing, and you know that will be supply and demand and as this rolls out and as we get different research to evaluate. Because I think one of the things that is really important to remember, because we now have RFI on a national basis, that serial producer did not increase their budget by 10% to take advantage of this. They're going to look at other metrics, other media that delivers, whether it's FSIs, whether it is uh, you know street teams, and sit there and say, does this deliver better return for my investment? And that's that's a metric that's going to roll out in the next. Yeah, I would say that just maybe quickly to add, you know, we, we typically television is priced on the cost of, of reaching individual viewers. So it's it's just pure exposure, impressions, audience exposure. And when we start to get into ITV models, then suddenly there are other metrics to look at that are more perform performance based. So, you know, in many cases it's still on a it could be on a CPM basis, a cost for reaching one thousand viewers. But it could also be on a cost per response basis. It could just be a flat fee. There are a number of different models that, that could be applied to that, that that are typically not applied in the traditional linear television market. But just a quick thing, we were talking earlier and we were saying that this is probably not a cost per click business. Is that correct? That, that's your impression? At this point. And I, I think one of the things, again, being in the digital world also, is you see the digital folks now, you know, when they originally started, it was cost per click, you know. Now it's, well, wait a second, there's value to the branding of, and I think one of the things that we talked about before is there is an engagement metric here, which TV, to be quite frank, does not easily measure, uh, but this, in, in, in this engaged spot is good, has, has a higher CPM. What that value is, we're going to find out. And Chris, you were saying earlier that in broadband video, the CPMs are much higher than even linear television, correct? Yeah, so I, I also oversee the investment of, of online video dollars for some of our clients, and we typically see that the CPMs in that space for the most premium content are, are two to three times what we would pay in television. So. If you're buying an episode of Desperate Housewives online from ABC.com, you're, you're going to pay a higher premium than you would if you were buying the same show in television. And the reason um, the price has been justified is that we have seen uh, performance metrics that show that it's worth it. So, you know, for example, we, we on average see about a 60% unaided brand recall when an ad is, is aired in, um, in online video content. And we might only see you know 15 or 20 percent unaided brand recall if that same ad were, were airing in television. So the two to three times performance helps to justify the two to three times CPM premium. Okay, I want to get uh, Bruce and, and, and uh, Chip involved here. And where do you see sort of the uh, 
the points of challenge in the process? Yeah, well, actually, I wanted to push kind of the rewind button a little bit on the, the discussion just, just as a grounding point. Television has more than one market. So there's a, a national marketplace, a national television marketplace, which right now, essentially Bill and I are representing here, Canoe, where Canoe is involved, it's really about national, and we work with our network partners to bring that to the marketplace. There's also a local or a spot marketplace, which, which SHIP rep represents. And so I just wanted to make that distinction because when, when planning and buying media, it's a different conversation. It's a, they're actually different marketplaces, and, and, and the way that they, they transact is, is slightly different. But, uh, to get to your question about, about the challenges, I, I think there are challenges. And one of them was already brought up, and that is kind of the challenge in the agency world, um, which is nobody really knows where this belongs. And in, in fairness to, to you, Chris, I, I thought that was very kind of you to admit that. But Starcom is actually pretty far ahead. What's that? Yeah, but, but Starcom is actually pretty far ahead in, in that you do have a team of specialists that are, that are paying a heck of a lot of attention to this and, and are dedicated to this kind of a world. There are other agencies where it's still truly up in the air, where they don't know if they're digital, it's the digital group that's going to buy it, so they're going to be the traditional TV buying group, where do planners fit in, where do the account managers fit in, and how does the creative agency fit in. So that piece of it is, is, is a challenge to begin with. Um, when it comes to the RFI application, uh, you know, it is, it is consciously a, a templatized solution. So we've tried to take as much um, friction out of the system we're having. Uh, the, the networks sell it. The, the, the consumer uses their same remote control. They don't have to buy a new device. Uh, it, it, the, the system has been set up to, to try to, to integrate into the way that the television is currently bought and sold. But there is an element to this that is not a standard conversation for a media planner or a media buyer, and that is on the back end, the fulfillment. So when you, when you talk to a media planner, generally they don't have to get involved in those kinds of discussions. That's something that the client usually does, is how, how many items do I have to produce, how much does that cost, how much does it cost to ship them, et cetera. So that is a, an, an element of, of interactivity, at least with the RFI product, that does actually have to be tackled. And we've got um, mathematical models that we can do, we can, we can bring to an advertiser to, to help estimate these things when they're in the planning mode, but it's a new conversation, and it's a new conversation that most people don't know yet know how to have. Yeah, I, uh, agencies are notorious for being siloed, right? So it's it's not a secret to those of us who work in agencies or, or with agencies. Uh, I know at, at our company, our, our mission has really been to, we call them cross athletes, so people who are trained across different disciplines. And we are also now, instead of having people who are dedicated to television and people who are dedicated to online video and people who are dedicated to advanced television, we're creating experts who can really talk the talk across all of those and really start to think about video holistically and how it all really fits together. So that is, that is still a, a challenge for agencies to, to get up to speed in that, in that area, but that's, that's one of the, the focus points for us. Chip, what are you uh, seeing in, in your uh, relationships with agencies and advertisers? Well, Challenge. first, I think we need to clone Chris, essentially, because that kind of thinking is not widespread throughout the industry. But there are some fundamental rules that are creating <coughs> tension, and no one's really talking about it yet. It's the first time I've heard the phrase non-working budget to discuss the actual cost to the client to actually create an interactive campaign. On the other hand, we're getting an awful lot of pressure on the operator side to amortize the substantial resources that have been put into the development of this technology. It cost us a lot of money to do this where we had a fine business, blithely selling 30s before. There also was an incremental cost to executing the campaign. So at some point we need to reconcile the non-working budget concept and what we need to do to actually amortize the cost of the, of the production of the execution however it's defined. But going back to what Bill said, I think the answer to this is going back to the evangelical, the idea of this is a game changer. We have to sell in the idea of addressability. It seems to me a lot like 15 years ago or more when I was in network cable, when we were going to advertisers and saying, you've got to buy something more than just broadcast network, broadcast network in your upfronts, you've got to add cable in. Now we have this other game changer with interactivity, and we need to get at the client level acceptance and enthusiasm for executing this new technology, finding out how it's gonna work, finding out how the business model rolls forward, charging the agency with finding a way to make it work, 
And then we need to change the metrics. Because if we go back to just Nielsen and CPM, we're going to leave the value on the table. So engagement is, I think, just one part of what's going on. But the math and the upfront is going to require a serial producer to take a look at whatever tens of millions they spent, and not just look at a CPM across all providers, but figure out what that engagement CPM was, or that engagement measure, and then reprice it against the different currencies, like taking dollars to euros. And then from that, figure out what apples to apples it would look like with a new media mix, because essentially we're adding a new media with interactivity. You know, without overcomplicating the, the, the process here, you know, TV buying is a very efficient process, uh, and I'll just talk about it on a national level. I mean, there is a lot of money spent by agencies that are charged every day with being more efficient in the way they charge their clients. So you've got this mechanism that's out there that you've got a buyer who is looking at a multi-brand advertiser, which further complicates this process. But you know, how do you place media in the business? Well, it's bought on impressions, it's bought on you know reach frequency on the planning side, and it's bought on you know uh, cost per thousand. This is a marketing uh, conversation that we're having and a promotions conversation that we're having on RFI. So when I go, go into the buyers at Starcom or, or General Motors, whatever, and I sit there and say, hey, I can really deliver great brochures that are going to lead to sales, it does not help them right now get their job done. Because it doesn't make, you know, there are procurement offices and when you're at an advertising, uh, you know, summit or, or conference, you hear procurement a lot these days. Uh, it's the charge is to the agency is to buy media more efficiently. This doesn't fit into that, and that's really what we have to figure out. And it goes to Chris's point of who's going to own this. It's not only who's going to own this, but it's kind of like when you, you know, when I look when advertisers, you know, we talk about testing something. What's the pass? What's the fail? We have to establish that this is more efficient. I mean, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. But it doesn't. But when they're doing their planning and they have to bring in a CPM at a plus whatever it is, and hit that number of GRPs on a weekly basis, this doesn't fit into that model. Right, Peter, I want to go to you, but, but uh, we are going to get some Q&A going here in the room, so please get your questions ready. Peter? Uh, so I just wanted to shift gears for a second, because this, this conversation has been very focused on advertising. And we're, we're, we're as, a, as, as a sequence, we're also very focused on advertising, what we're doing with Chip and Comcast is about local ads. What we're doing with Canoe and with Rainbow is about national 30-second spots. But there's an entirely other side to this business, too, which is the programming side. Um, and, you know, we believe that that's really a, a fertile ground for interactivity. And I'll, I'll talk about that model because it's a little bit different, for example, than the model that we're working on with Bruce. So, Bruce, I'll, I'll say this and you correct me if I'm wrong, but Canoe's model, and it, you know, it's a really smart, important model for the industry, is to have a kind of templatized approach that 30, 40, 50, 60 networks can all embrace. And the idea is that it's simple enough that every operator can certify it and get it on, and the advertisers know what it is and can buy it. And that has to happen. So, you know, ha hats off to Canoe for making that happen. There's another model, though, which is that programmers, and Bill can probably attest to this, programmers tend to be very brand-centric. And they're really about their brand, their look and feel, their unique characteristics, and how they communicate that to their viewers. So, you know, ESPN doesn't want to be AMC, which doesn't want to be MTV, et cetera. They want their own unique uh, positioning out there. And what, what, one, one of the areas that we're finding is getting um, more momentum is the programmers and the marketers at the networks are now starting to think about interactivity as part of what they deploy as they think about their content. Nothing to do with 30 second spots or with, with local spots. And you know, our, our feeling also is that when the programmers start to deploy interactivity sort of as a second nature, simply as a part of the way they design their content, then interactivity will really have taken off. 
And that, you know, that's just a whole other area that we haven't even begun to speak about on this panel. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, and not to slate anybody's job here, but a lot of times it feels to me like we're putting the cart before the horse when we talk about interactive advertising, where we haven't really gotten the eyeballs and the usage for interactivity in the first place. And, and I agree with you, I think when more programmers really start to use this as a tool, that's when we're going to really see ITV take off. The, 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 my... the, the good thing, though, of course, is this, this is the first model, right? I mean, the, these guys are setting up a business to finance the whole interactive world, so it, it has to happen this way, and it's, it's really great to see it happening. There's just, right. there's just more out there. Right. Let's um, see, are there some questions in the audience yet? One over here? Yeah, so the question is about programming. Just, can just, I to, just to repeat the question in case you didn't hear it over here, it's, it's um, <clears throat> how will ITV uh, increase ratings as opposed to just engagement? Can, can I take a shot of that and then pile on? Um, so they're actually part of the same thing. I, I think if you, if you increase uh, people's engagement with the program, so whether you can measure that or not, the point is that that, that individual who is now engaged in interactivity is going to stay with that program through the commercial break and be in that program on the other side of the commercial break. And if you can you can show that, that less people are leaving that program to go to another channel, that means that your ratings over time are actually lifting. So there's the delta between um, tune away, uh, people who have tuned away from that channel to go elsewhere, and, and those who have decided to stay, and it's that delta that's actually the increased rating. So the engagement, whether we can measure that kind of uh, nebulous concept or not, can be directly measured by by the number of eyeballs that actually stuck with that network across time. Yeah, just just to add to what uh, Bruce said, um, we we are seeing definitive metrics that show that people stay on the channel longer if there's interactivity. And as Bruce said, that is a direct correlation to a ratings increase. And we did actually we did one very specific study. It was a real apples to apples study where. Um, we had an interactive program on Dish Network, and that same program was not interactive everywhere else. And we looked at the ratings on Dish compared to the ratings everywhere else, and then we looked at those ratings against um, the Dish ratings versus the non-Dish ratings over a long period of time. So we could see if there was any delta between Dish and everybody else, and then we could see the new delta between Dish and everybody else with interactivity. And the program experienced an 18% ratings bump as a consequence of being interactive. I mean, that's a huge number. I, I don't think that we can count on that kind of number, but it's the first apples to apples study that we did with real ratings impact of interactivity. Uh, actually, I'm going I'm to make this all about me for a second, yeah. or at least all about us. And we, we found similar things with early research, even in RFI, which is in commercial. Uh, it, essentially interactivity, where those, uh, a test cell which actually has interactivity versus a control cell which does not have interactivity, and the unaided ad awareness, aided ad awareness, unaided brand awareness, and aided brand awareness, and even purchase intent, um, actually goes up for those who actually have interactivity versus those who didn't. And, and that's whether they interacted or not. So simply having the interactivity actually lifts uh, the awareness of, of, of the commercial. And in content, it's the same basic concept. So interactivity does actually increase engagement, but it's a it's a hard metric to prove consistently um, across time. The question over here. Yeah, um, from a business perspective, how incentive are you to move that interactivity to um, second screens, other you know secondary screens versus? having it only on the primary screen. Is there a good business model to move it over and kind of decouple the programming with the interactivity, but splitting it across devices? You're talking about sort of a multi-platform model? Right, from a business perspective, is there more of a driver to keep it on that primary screen because that's where the actual eyeball is, or is there a good business model to move it over? 
Well, I, I, I probably would answer that from two perspectives. First, from the programmer's standpoint, I think a programmer will do anything that increases the viewer's engagement to that program and keeps them tuned in longer. So when you, you know, I don't know if you can make a blanket statement about second screen, whether that pulls away <coughs> or it doesn't pull away. I mean, you know, the one thing we always, you know, I forget in some of these conversations is the first pull away, you know, in television was probably the kitchen and the refrigerator. I mean, people do not stay glued to commercials. They didn't 20 years ago, they didn't 50 years ago. So from a programmer standpoint, if they can do second screen, primary screen, RFI, uh, voting polling trivia within the programming, if the research proves that that's going to keep a consumer engaged or a viewer engaged and probably eventually lead to a rating increase, they'll be all for it. Everything I just said from a programmer's standpoint is also true from the advertiser's standpoint. If I can show Chris that having this second screen makes that commercial message more effective, you know, then the advertiser will jump on it. I think the thing that digital has done today, though, is you have, you know, we're all wonderful salespeople. We just can't go in anymore and go, Chris, trust me, believe me, this works. There's got, there has to be research behind it. Chip, you're part of this multi-platform world, so how would you uh, answer that? You know, one of the things that we're excited about, and you'll start to see it more frequently in the trades, is IVOT, so small i, capital V-O-D. We're taking the, rem the remind record, the telescoping, and the RFI capability, and by the end of the year-ish, we will have that um, capable of being deployed on all of our VOD assets. So a truck manufacturer could have a 30 second spot which touts a new model which took you to a five minute piece where everyone was attractive and burly and the truck was a hero. And at the end of that you could have an RFI um, or you could telescope to another piece of content. Or if you were a programmer, we could go to a 30 second spot for the Video Music Awards going to a piece of content about that which had a remind record. So we're taking this interactive stuff and putting it on top of the second screen, if you will, for VOD, where there is greater viewer immersion and greater viewer engagement. And it's sort of a simple way of doing it, but it seems to be working, so that would be good. Peter, you had a comment? Um, two things on, on two screens. So we support two screens. We think it's going to be a, a good business for us and for our customers. Um, there's a lot of momentum right now around two screen. Uh, but our sense of this from talking primarily to programmers is that the momentum is generated in large part because it's so much easier at the moment to do you know, uh, an iPad app than it is to do an EBIF app. Um, that, that doesn't mean it's always going to be easier. Um, but the sense that we're getting from most programmers is at the end of the day, one screen is really the place that we want to be because that's where the customer is most engaged. Two screen will always be a business, but it feels more ancillary. At least that's, that's our sense of where the market is right now. Other you, questions out here? We, well, I was just going to add to that. Bill and I were talking about this a couple nights ago. I, the, the, the television marketplace, the linear television marketplace, is still a very, very healthy marketplace. I think if, if the Boy, you go to these conferences and, and it, it feels like well, regular television is dead and it couldn't be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, I think we're stepping into a, possibly one of the strongest TV marketplaces we've seen in many, many years. So regular TV isn't dead and it also dominates the living room and it continues to dominate the living room in terms of number of hours spent with, me, with the medium, whatever. So if you think of a kind of a standard TV marketplace, 30 second spots, TV that we've all known and loved our entire lives, that is, that is a, that's the mighty Mississippi. That is a big river, and um, and the ability to flooding river. Flooding river. The, pardon me. Yeah. Flooding river. Uh, flooding river. And, and, yeah, exactly. And it's, so it's, it's it's a big wide river, and and if you can affect that, um, then you've really done something, which is really about doing it at scale, which is really kind of what what canoe is all about. Um, and I think that there will always be these kind of roil roiling whitewater rapids that, that lead into that big river. And, and there's interesting stuff happening there, and I, I know virtually everybody here is involved in that kind of stuff. But I think that the concept that we're dealing with here is let's let's get it, let's be in the river because that's that's where the, the big stuff is happening. The canoe metaphors are just flowing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, one more question. Over here. Thank you. Uh, 
Just here comes the mic. Thanks. Um, I stepped in a little late, so you may have already addressed this, but um, relative to your, to your comment about one screen versus two screens, how do you reconcile that, you know, these, these uh, interactive advertisements take you away from, the consumer away from the program, and the idea is to keep them sticking to the program? So I, I'm just not quite there that the one screen strategy is the, you know, kind of the way things are going to go. Have you ever been asked that before, Bill? Yeah, the first time. Um, one of the benefits that uh, we love about the Canoe RFI model is that we do not do that at all. All of the interactivity takes place within the 30 second spot. So we're not telescoping off of the channel at all. So uh, that is a major benefit when you sit down and talk to your programming team and go, no, 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 as Bruce said before, this will hopefully and research has shown that will keep people through the break, not the reverse, which is pushing them away. You know, we've got a $2 billion business at Spotlight selling those 30-second spots, so we're very cognizant of that as well. And our parent company on the cable side is very focused on empowering the consumer. So what's happening with our telescoping, when the overlay comes up, the consumer has the option to view now or to view later. Viewing later means I want to see that spot about the truck, but I'm not going to come away from Dancing with the Stars. View later, it goes away and goes to a playlist where that consumer can come back at a different time and watch all the content when they're not engaged elsewhere and watch content they've saved. In a similar fashion, the Remind Record functionality is flexible enough where if you feel that you're a mighty broadcast network and you're going to make sure that people don't time shift, you could just put up reminder not recording and they would not have the option to record and time shift the program. It, it just seems like though with an, with an app or an, uh, a tablet that it would be easier for the consumer to accomplish their goals you know and be able to multitask and simultaneously kind of do these things so the advertiser would win and the programmer would win. I, I think one of the uh, filters that we have to use with interactivity it's a very powerful tool and you know, to, to your point before about this is not an advertising discussion, it truly really is not to a certain degree. The filter that we have to make sure with what we're using with interactivity is, is this a good programming experience? Does the commercial, does the interactivity that we're playing in this environment make the consumer sit there or the viewer sit there and say, this is something that I see a benefit to? Whether that's in single screen you know, I mean, I'll use sports as an analogy. I mean, sports is, a, to me, a, a very good example of a two-screen application. Because we may be watching the same game, and you may want to check out one sport score on your iPad, and I may want to check out another. There are other applications where the single screen makes the most sense. And I think that's the filter that we have to use here, is what makes sense. Okay, one last, just very quick question. What would a conference be without asking you for some sort of prediction or forecast or something? Um, I'm not gonna ask you, you know, how big a business is it gonna be in 2020 or anything like that. But, uh, it, over the course of the next year, when, when we're back here, what are going to be some of the um, key points of progress that we're going to see, especially as it relates to some of those challenges we were talking about, um, just within the next year? Where, where do you see things going? Bill, you want to just go, well, let's just go down Yeah, there. I think uh, the, the major thing that I see changing is when we talked about more networks rolling out, scaling up to 30, 40 million homes, I think that change of itself or the fact that that becomes a real national play will, and again, Starcom is definitely one of the more progressive agencies, but that's going to force agencies to find an owner for this. And I think that's what we'll see probably in the next 12 months. I would say that uh, we also will see um, some really in-depth conversations with, with advertisers about the back-end metrics and how it's actually working for them. So the definition of success is, is completely different from one advertiser to the next. And I, I think there were, right now there's still a lot of grappling with what does that actually mean. And, and I think people are trying to make uh, generalizations about that. And I'm not sure that there are generalizations. I think that, there are, that those are client offer tactic specific discussions and I think we're going to find in the next 12 months that we've narrowed that down pretty significantly with, with specific advertisers.
Okay, and just a point of information, um, I was wrong. We actually do have more time, so uh, I had a schedule wrong. What was that? So um, if you do have more questions, we can get to those. But let's continue down the line. Yeah, I'd say from the agency perspective, I agree with both of these guys. We're, we're definitely going to figure out where ITV lives within the agency infrastructure. Um, I think we're also going to see, <coughs> pardon me, agency experts become not just experts from a branding perspective, which is typically what my folks in my agency are. They, they understand brand building, but they're also going to start to adopt more performance um, expertise. So they're gonna to start to look more like direct response agencies that, that because we're really starting to see the, the merging of both you know, brand-based campaigns and, and truly performance-based campaigns, which right now are two completely separate units within the agency world. So we'll start to see those come together. I think we'll see more ubiquitous deployment. Um, we are far away from where we were six months ago, but where we were six months ago was where we were supposed to be in 2006. So we're doing a little bit of catch up here. So I think that we'll roll this out by the end of the calendar year. I think a success metric on the ad sales side would be to have um, a deep enough roster of varied accounts with enough case studies where we can go back and say this worked, this didn't, and then back into your performance point, back into the metric. So if I rolled more trucks off a car lot, what was it within the advertising campaign that was different from a test case perhaps that I can then use as a new metric moving forward? Because we're going to have to figure out this new dialogue. And to hear Chris say that there is a continuing evolution in the agencies is great, but it also puts the pressure on the sales side to make sure that we have a corresponding evolution so we can answer your questions, deliver you invoices, work with you on metrics, and develop a scale which works as fluidly as the Nielsen-dominated 30-second spot commerce that in these conventions we kind of sneer about, but which pay for it. So I think that's what it will be a year from now. So I agree with what you all said. So scale, metrics, ownership of the agencies, you know, canoe with 20 to 30 networks, 40 million EPIF homes, I mean, all, all that's fantastic. Um, I, I just want to say two things, specifically to what Chris said, which, is a, which really is a huge opportunity, which we really haven't talked about. The direct marketing business is a $150 billion business. And you don't have to take a lot of that share to make it big for interactivity. Uh, and that, you know, I think there will probably be incursions into that space. And then there's just one other issue that we haven't talked about at all that I think will be settled within a year and will be really important to this business taking off, which is the relationship between the programmer and the operator in terms of the business model um, related to getting on a service provider and doing interactivity. Because that, that's, that's sort of in flux at the moment now too and is, is, is hindering uh, the ability for some things to move forward. Actually, that sparks another thought. I'm sorry, I don't mean to hog the mic, but uh, but I think we'll also see um, much greater uh, fluidity in systems because that is actually an element of this right now. That the TV marketplace has been built over so many decades, and and the way that it is transacted, there are systems that reside within a network, systems that reside within an agency to process that uh, that transaction, and um, we're working with with the system vendors now. And uh, Harvey, thank you. I would give you a shout out. Um, the system vendors to actually make sure that, that as interactivity grows and scales, that that process can actually be transacted within the systems, which is a, a big piece of this. You're talking about all the back end <coughs> processes and correct and reporting and metrics and all that. Right. Um, additional questions from the audience? Here's the mic coming up. Based on the relationship, this is really more towards the local side, the relationship that exists between advertisers and account executives. Do you see this as a natural extension, the interactive space uh, to their existing sales teams, or do you envision independent sales staff that are just selling this as a standalone problem? In the sense that the EBIF apps are enhancement to the 30s, those will be, and as is VOD, those pieces will be built into the existing staffs. There is part of the resources coming out are more training. Uh, you also have to evaluate your staff. You're asking people to do different things and you're looking at different skill sets. Um, we have a pretty robust Xfinity um, online local presence that had started off to be an independent team 
over the course of time, that's morphed into our 3,200 people strong salespeople locally. There are still, and there will be with all of the advanced apps, there need to be people at the, you know, at the top in terms of understanding the product development, how it works, and kind of direct it. So there will be divisional leads against many of these properties. But ultimately, the ecology is all of these are connected in the same campaign, and there will be one person that goes in. Now we may have support staff, so you may have a coordinator for online that follows a salesperson into a local Chevy, uh, Chevy dealer association or a local bank to help with the execution, because a lot of this is different. One of the things we're finding is you finally get a multi-platform campaign, and then you fill some client's inbox up with 17 different spec sheets and different timelines. We need to find a way to process that so it makes sense. It's not just a question of send the tape here. So some of that needs to be worked out. Uh, there's only so much our people can, can process, so we'll throw more people at the problem, but ultimately there'll be a signal lead. And Chris, on the agency side, you see a similar integration of responsibilities, or will it still be these uh, silos? Uh, no, we're definitely seeing silos breaking down. Um, there is, quite frankly, a little bit of a turf war on where some of these things live because sometimes the folks who work in the digital side of the house think that they should have ownership of this because it looks a lot like the online space, but the television folks think they should have ownership of it because it exists on a television set. So, so a lot of it is is sort of placing placing the expertise and the responsibility in the area that makes most sense based on our contract with clients. So sometimes there are multiple agencies working on uh, a particular client's piece of business, and also just the the, uh, the talent that we have in house, um, and how how willing um, some folks are to embrace <coughs> things. So if we have folks who are used to just turning through television buys and they're just uh, you know turning out that efficiency, they may not be the right person to take oversight of this. But um, again, we're, we're trying to look at things from more of a video neutral perspective. And so we are training people to be able to speak to both sides. And, um, and those people are sort of naturally rising to the top who are capable of doing it. Uh, we've lived through the development and growth of internet advertising. Are there lessons from that whole experience that are going to apply here in the ITV world? Yeah, I think so. I remember when uh, I started selling this new website that you know, we'd go into agencies back in 1995 and they didn't think it really mattered that much. It was called weather.com. And I think one of the lessons which Chris just alluded to was there's, back in 95 there was, this did not fit into the TV box, I don't want to deal with it. I don't think that is there at an agency right now. I think there's a realization. One of the things that, you know, you don't realize how much you know about the TV business until you talk to someone who doesn't. There's a lot of information a buyer has to process. There's 90 some odd cable networks. I mean, there's a lot of tracking. There's, there's a lot of programming out there. To stay an expert in that field is not easy, but I think the lesson that was learned is there's not uh, they don't want to punt on this. They want to figure out how do we make it work. And that I think is, is a lesson that was well learned. Anybody else want to tackle that? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, if you want to remain relevant in, in the industry, <laughs> you have to embrace it or else you're, you're a dinosaur and you'll be left behind. Any last um, thoughts that you want to leave the audience with? We just have one more minute. What, what, should they, what should they walk away with from this panel? I, I, have, I have one. Uh, this is just fantastic because um, you're seeing the model happen, uh, you know, right, right on this panel. And, and um, I, I have, there was, we all met, you know, for like 15 minutes beforehand to make sure that we were doing what Craig wanted us to do. And um, uh, uh, there, was, there was this little sparring contest between Bill and Chris, and you know, Chris said, "Well, you, you want too much money," and Bill said, you, "You're willing to pay too little." And you know, there, like in, in that 15 seconds, you had an industry shaping. You know, because these, these guys are now having the typical sparring that happens when there's a real business going on. It was it was just great to see, and you really you heard it up here, and I think it's fantastic. 
I'm just going to, actually, uh, the, the two things that I wanted to kind of lead the audience with, it, actually you had mentioned earlier, both of them, one is that for kind of in-program apps, there's the opportunity to increase engagement, increase, increase ratings, and that's, that is, I think, a almost a self-made business when it, when it happens at scale. And the second is a huge amount of direct marketing money that can be ported over into uh, interactivity. It's just, how do you get that from here? And I, we're figuring that out. Add one thing to what Peter said, and, and I, don't, I don't know if that was sparring, but uh, uh, I think one of the things that you learn in sales very early on is price does not close. If you do not see a value in something, there is not a discussion about what it's worth. And I think that the, the change over the last 12 months, and I think a year from now, it'll probably be a little bit of a different conversation. There is a recognition that there's value here. Now the question becomes is what is that worth? And that's a great conversation to be in. We were not there a year ago. Good point. So we'll go backstage, we'll wrap up a deal, and we'll start hawking Chris's new cereal, get those RFIs out there, and everybody will be happy. So um, uh, everybody, uh, just stay right here. There's another great session following this one. But let's give a big round of applause to these experts. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your time.